Hello, everyone. Welcome to Manomet's first webinar in our small sit virtual series uh, called Migratory Strategies of Wimbrel Nesting in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, uh, presented by senior shorebird scientist Shiloh Schulte, PhD. Uh, I am Gina Wark, Manomet Senior Director of Marketing Communications. If you are new to Manomet, a little background on our organization. We use science and collaboration to strengthen bird migration routes, coastal ecosystems, and working lands and seas across the Western Hemisphere. And if you're a friend, volunteer, trustee, or donor to Manomet already, then thank you. It's really only with your support that we can continue to get our boots muddy doing hands-on science in collaboration with local partners. And speaking of getting muddy, just a couple of housekeeping notes for today's webinar. Uh, we welcome your curiosity, so please tip, type any questions you have into the Q&A box, and Shiloh will be happy to answer them at the end of his presentation. Uh, the chat, chat section we can reserve for comments or any tech issues you might be having. And now I'm going to turn it over to our Vice President of Science and Minimet veteran, Stephen Brown, PhD, to introduce Shiloh. Floor is yours, Stephen. Thanks very much, Jean. Well, welcome to today's webinar, everyone. We're delighted to have you here. This seminar is part of our science webinar series where we explore how Manomet science and that of our partners is, is being applied to all sorts of critical conservation issues. And we really appreciate your spending some time with us today. Today, we're gonna to be hearing from Dr. Shiloh Schulte. As Gene said, he's our senior scientist in our shorebird science program. And Shiloh started working with Manomet back in 2002. And aside from a short break to go and get his PhD, he's been with us ever since. In that time, he's led the American Oyster Catcher Recovery Initiative, which is one of our very most successful shorebird recovery efforts. And he's also joined the Wimbrel team and is leading the study in the Arctic, which contributes overall to the, the goal of guiding effective conservation by trying to identify where and when populations are limited. He'll be sharing some of his fascinating and critical findings with us today, and it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Shiloh Schulte. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, thanks, Jean, and thanks everybody for joining us. This is a great turnout. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I'm going to rely on you, Jean, um, to tell me if it's not working. Sure thing. There we go. Okay. Um, so, just in case you guys are just a quick housekeeping, I'm seeing a the pen. Um, Panelists on the side, you may want to minimize that window if you're if it's blocking part of this part of the slide for you, um, because my slides are full screen. Um, again, thank you for joining us. Um, I'm going to be talking about a subject that's very near and dear to my heart, which is working in the Arctic, and working with a really fascinating species, um, the Wimbrel. Uh, hopefully, um, I will go over a little bit about um, the family, the curlews that that Wimbrel belong to, what sort of what a Wimbrel is, but very briefly since you're coming to a seminar on migratory strategies of Wimbrel, you probably have already know what a Wimbrel looks like. Um, but I'm gonna go over that quickly and then uh, really get into some of the, um, the story of how uh, we came to work with uh, Wimbrel in the Arctic, as well as where that uh, work fits into the bigger picture of Wimbrel research and conservation. Um, talk about some of the lessons, the key points that we've learned, and then where do we go from here? Um, and I'm going to try to make sure that I don't just get carried away and use up the whole time for this uh, seminar talking because I do want to have a, a conversation and engage with any questions um, or discussion uh, towards the end of this. So please, as, as Jean said, go ahead and as I'm going, if you think of a question, just drop it in the Q&A and we will have a good discussion at the end. Okay, so curlews are a um, are large shorebirds, long curved bill. Those are the characteristics that you can identify a curlew fairly easily. Um, there are worldwide there were nine uh, curlew species. If you look on um, some sources, they still say there are nine because two, the slender billed curlew and the Eskimo curlew, have not officially been declared extinct. But there have not been records of either of those species in a long time, and they're currently believed to be extinct. Um, and this is relevant because of the seven remaining species, uh, most of those are also uh, threatened in some way um, or in, in decline. Um, so it's a very, uh, it's a beautiful um, species group. It's really fascinating and, and also under a lot of threat. Um, the threats, um, if for those of you who have been 
paying attention to bird conservation will not come as a surprise. Um, there's habitat loss, climate change, um, oil spills, development, predators, hunting, disturbance. Um, there's more, but those are some of the bigger ones. Um, there's micro, lots of you know, contamination and, and, um, and issues at, um, at some of these stop over sites that aren't listed here, but um, those are sort of the primary drivers of threats. And then we need to address those survival threats um, as well as habitat loss. Um, and so to do some of that, we need to do some research on uh, estimating what the survival rates are and the breeding success so we can model the um, the different what different aspects of the life cycle are are most important and where our conservation um, can be most effective. Um, so these two species I have seen on the screen here, um, the wimbrel on the top and the long-billed curlew on the bottom are two of the more um, widespread or at least more, um, let's say common, but native to North America. There's also the bristle-thighed curlew um, in the in Western Alaska um, that just comes into uh, just comes into this continent and the rest of other species are uh, in Europe and Asia primarily as well as um, Australia. Um, so specifically talking today about the wimbrel, um, Numenius phaeopis hudsonicus, so it's the Hudsonian wimbrel um, in North America, and then there's the Eurasian wimbrel, uh, the corresponding species in, um, in Europe and Asia. Um, and then this curlew is mid-sized. Um, if you hold it in your hands, you'll see pictures. It's about the size of a football. It kind of feels that way. Same color even. Um, um, they are a long distance migrant and that's sort of the interesting um, aspect or piece of this work that we'll really be talking about today. And as I said, it's one of those curlews that's in decline um, and the Western Atlantic population and specifically is in rapid decline. That's, the, that's sort of what you think of as the Atlantic flyway. Um, but the um, the population that moves down down along the, the uh, Western Atlantic as opposed to the Eastern Atlantic, which is Iceland and um, Ireland, Europe, um, and Africa. But this is the Western Atlantic population in, in decline. And then these critical needs that we are seeing right now are to really map these locations um, where the birds are are migrating, breeding, and wintering um, for the different populations. So we can, and not just like big picture, but at a fine scale, what the locations are, what the needs are at those sites, and then what the risks are specific to each of those. And then, as I said, to estimate survival and breeding success um, to, to model that, those, that species um, life cycle and identify where we can have the greatest impact. Um, so a little bit of background on, on Wimbrel tracking. Um, there actually has been a fair amount of work on using GPS and um, uh, other satellite um, tracking of Wimbrels going back as far as uh, 2008 um, in Georgia uh, with the Georgia DNR um, started tracking Wimbrels as along with work uh, with College of William and Mary in Virginia and started to, um, to just to figure out what the the pathways were for the species that were the, the individuals that were using um, the Southern Atlantic and Central Atlantic coast uh, in the fall and the spring. Um, and then uh, in a similar time frame, a little bit later, um, this work started in Alaska um, with USGS and US Fish and Wildlife Service Alaska tracking wimbrel nesting in interior Alaska, and then again on the on North Slope, uh, sort of the central and western part of the uh, North Slope of Alaska. Um, and then further on, further there's work um, again with College of William and Mary um, and DNR um, connections working up in um, in northern Canada in the McKinsey River um, and um, at Manomet. Um, We've been partnering with these organizations and then started um, a, a work on the uh, Cape Cod looking at uh, juvenile wimbrel migration and survival, which is a uh, an aspect of the life cycle that's very difficult to uh, understand. It's very hard to get your hands on a juvenile wimbrel and uh, learn something about it. And so that's something that, um, that Brad Wynn and Alan Neidl started and I've been helping with um, and now is, um, expanded and is expanding into a bigger program. Um, to, uh, to really try to understand what's happening with juvenile wimbrel um, in South Bend migration all the way up to um, when they return to breed several years later, um, which is an interesting and, and sort of challenging missing piece. Um, and then relatively recently, last couple of years, um, we've started an, an exciting new program in, in Texas, um, in collaboration with the University of Oklahoma, looking at, um, at Wimbrel using a, um, a really important stopover region um, from Texas through Southern Louisiana um, and uh, tracking how they're, how they're using that space, how they're, how they're using agricultural fields and the importance of that um, northbound 
stopover into, into migration um, in, as part of their migration. And so um, what these tracking studies have done is allowed us to map um, large scale pathways for, um, uh, for that windmills are using. And as you can see uh, here, the white lines show um, southbound migration and sort of the, the teal, the greenish lines um, show northbound migration and the arrows help with that. Um, and you can see on the on the Atlantic side, these birds are coming from northern Canada as well as um, the western Hudson Bay region and sort of have this elliptical migration, but it is almost a migration contained within another. There's a, a group that does a shorter distance um, through the southeast U.S. and then a group that goes longer distance um, from uh, northwest Canada all the way down into Brazil, Suriname, and um, the eastern, central and eastern um, uh, coast of South America. And then over on the West Coast, you have birds that are breeding in Alaska um, and are migrating much more closely along the coast um, down as far as uh, Southern Chile um, or as far North as um, California, depending on. And so there's a huge um, latitude range of wintering habitat for that for that population. And so this is this has all been um, mapped for with devices that um, going from some GPS devices and some that are less accurate, but um, at, a, at a local scale, but very accurate at a large scale. Um, and so we're really starting to, we really have a pretty um, good picture of the large scale uh, mapping of, of windmill movement from all of these studies that have happened over, over the last um, couple of decades. And so you might be asking at this point, well, this is a lot of, a lot of time and effort and tracking, and you guys have some really cool maps. So why are we still continuing to tag, um, put out tags on, on these birds? Well, it's a great question. I'm very glad you just asked um, because I happen to have a slide that talks about that. Um, so we're gonna move into talking about what is going on with GPS tracking technology. And it turns out that um, if you, the temptation is always to wait a little bit because it seems like every year um, or even you know on the monthly basis, the technology is improving. And now we have these very small transmitters as small as two grams that can track on small shorebirds or with the larger tags that these wimbrel can hold, um, we can learn a tremendous amount of more inf more information per tag per bird that goes out. So rather than just knowing the location of the bird, we can know the location down to a much, much more precise, um, but also well in flight, you can um, track, uh, you have accelerometers that are built in, so you can actually track the movement response in the air column to um, changing weather conditions. And that's really what um, the University of Oklahoma came in and, and started working with us. They were interested in how these birds are responding in real time to large scale weather systems. Um, and we're really interested in the sort of fine scale movements of birds, um, both on the breeding grounds for nesting, as well as during the during the migration, what how exactly they're using these, um, these stopover sites um, and how that can it, uh, influence our conservation strategy, whether we're working, we're all staying in these um, refuges and we're working with uh, refuge land managers or whether they're going out into private lands and we're looking at um, developing private land coalitions. And it turns out both things are happening and it really, um, it, it really informs our approach to conservation when we can understand what's happening at a really fine scale. Um, and then with these newer tags, you can get these um, really uh, incredibly detailed data, not just from you know once one location every day or two, but you can get locations every 15 minutes or even more frequently than that if you need to, um, and then get near real-time connection downloads from Argos satellites and, and cell towers. And so we're, we are, are able to understand what these birds are doing at a much more granular level, which allows us to do things like track nesting success remotely with... Um, with GPS tag birds. And um, as you'll see a few other really interesting um, elements come out of this, uh, come out of this work. Um, so let's jump up to what we're talking about here. Um, I've given you that overview, but we're gonna talk about what we're doing in the Arctic. And that blue star um, on Alaska in the upper left-hand corner of your screen is shows the location of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. It's on the north, uh, east corner, it is the northeast corner of Alaska, um, and specifically, we're mostly we're talking about what's happening on the Arctic coastal plain um, from the Brooks Range north to the Arctic Ocean. Um, this is a breeding site for Wimbrel. Um, this, this open tundra habitat is um, what they're looking for um, in, this, in this area for, for breeding. Uh, it's a very short breeding season. Um, they arrive right at the very end of May um, in, from northbound migration, and um, by mostly by July, but certainly by August, um, these birds are migrating out of there. Um, and then the young birds follow. 
um, in late August, leaving the um, this this region. Um, some of the early nesters, or if they fail nesting, they may leave as early as the very end of June. So they might only be on the Arctic um, nesting grounds for about a month or maybe two months um, before heading south again. So these are really tropical birds that are using um, the Arctic during a very specific time window of the year um, to raise young. Um, but the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge provides this nesting and staging habitat for Wimbrel. And as we'll see from throughout the hemisphere, um, it provides a really valuable resource for adults as they arrive. There are berries, uh, crowberries that they're, they're eating, as well as many other species of berries. Um, and then as the invertebrates start to come out, as the, as the snow melts and the, and the tundra warms, um, the invertebrates are picked off by the adults, but they're also key to the rapid growth of the um, young birds as they, after they hatch in July. Um, and this is what it looks like. Um, this is what Wimbrel comes in and sees this, and this is a sort of ideal Wimbrel nesting habitat um, in the in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. This is the um, up, upper end or the middle to upper end of the Katakturk River Valley in central part of the um, coastal plain of the Arctic. And it's one of my favorite places in the world. And you can see why just looking at this. Um, it doesn't always look quite like this. More often it looks more like this. Um, this is our, our camp. Um, I think this is the one from 2019. Um, and this is often the, the wet, what the weather is like in the end of May or in early June, which is when the Wimbrel are there. Um, when I took this picture, there actually were Wimbrel nesting, you know, a few hundred meters um, off to the to the left of what you're looking at. And um, they were sitting on eggs and they would sit on eggs through this. And then, you know, after a day or so and the snow melts, um, the weather warms up, they go back to displaying and fighting with each other, but they're, they will incubate their eggs throughout something like this, um, which it gives them a slight advantage over some of the um, other shorebird species that are a little smaller and um, have a harder time with this, with this uh, weather conditions. But it is a challenging environment to live in. I mean, you can get this, this conditions literally any point of the year up there um, at any time. So they have to be ready for that and the chicks have to be ready for that. Um, uh, and the reason we were up at that site actually was not to, to study Wimbrel. Um, this was in 2019 when I um, when we first started looking at this. Uh, Manomet and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, Alaska, um, collaborate on Arctic research and have done so for many years. Um, and the reason we were at that site in the, in the refuge um, was to conduct these PRISM surveys to monitor dis distribution and abundance of nesting shorebirds. Um, and bonus points if anybody wants to guess what that shorebird species is, unless I already showed you this picture before, but if you want to throw in a, a guess in the chat or the or Q and A as to what that shorebird is, I'll tell you at the end. Um, but we were looking at uh, nesting shorebirds um, to, to, and this is a long-term program um, to understand how um, the distribution and abundance is changing over time um, throughout the Arctic. Um, it's done by the Canadian um, Wildlife Service Environment Canada, um, the, the Fish and Wildlife Service collaborates with Manomet, but in the U.S., um, we essentially have to raise funds each year to um, conduct those surveys, as opposed to having it be funded by a federal agency. Um, but we are we have been successful in doing that so far, and we'll continue to be to, to attempt that. Um, but these are it's a challenging survey, as you can see from the picture below. Our our Uber is a little different than the usual one you'd, you'd get. Um, you have to travel by helicopter to do these surveys um, because the distances are vast and there are no um, points to land uh, with a plane um, for most of the sites we go to. Um, so you're, you're traveling by a very small bubble with a, a spinny thing on top, um, traveling around in the middle of nowhere in Northern Alaska. It's again, one of my favorite things to do. Um, we're also there studying shorebird nest survival um, and predation pressure. Um, as well as tracking other shorebirds to understand local habitat use and migration, migration pathways. So while we were there at this field site, we had these three different projects going on. And I said, well, why don't we add a fourth one? Um, because there's not enough to do. We have at least three hours in the day that we're, not, that we're still sleeping. We could do something else. Um, so, so what happened is on one of my days off, um, while we were in that project, and the way it works is you have four people, but only three of them can fit in the helicopter in a given day. So the fourth person rotates out. And so, of course, I spent the day wandering down the, the valley looking for shorebirds um, and um, found some. And this in particular was a uh, was very exciting because the uh, the species that I, I heard was a wimbrel and, and wimbrel are patchily distributed. They're very 
typically very hard to find. And when you do find a pair, you may not see another one for a long time. That's sort of the, the understanding. Um, and so when I heard Wimbrel, um, make sure this is actually going to work. Oh no, can't get this to work. Um, give me a moment and I'll figure it and I'll get this, get this to play. It was working perfectly yesterday, of course. Um, but I heard Wimbrel in the calling in the valley. So I spent set out to try to find some or try to find them. Um, I don't know why this isn't working. Um, apologies. I'm actually going to stop my screen share for a second and go back to it. Let's try this again. And well, that's unfortunate. There we go. Well, I'm not gonna, unfortunately going to play the video that I was, I was hoping to show you folks. It was working perfectly before, but it's not now. In any event, there were Wimbrel in the valley. And, um, and it was very exciting because when I found this Wimbrel nest, um, it, it was, uh, you know, an exciting moment that I'd never seen one before. But then, and this was the where serendipity can develop an entire line of uh, research. Um, at that moment, a uh, jeer falcon came down through the valley, um, which was also a bird that I hadn't seen in the Arctic before. So that was another exciting moment. But what it did was it, as it flew down the valley, the wimbrel that had the that were at the nest that I had found stopped paying attention to me and launched into the air because the jeer falcon is a large falcon and it's a, one of its favorite food might be a large shorebird. So they went up in the air and started calling, alarm calling. And then from right down the valley came another pair, took off and started flying and circling and calling. And I was like, wow, there's two pair of wimbrel here. And then a third pair and a fourth pair and a fifth and a sixth and a seventh. And all the way down the valley, looking as far as I could see, as the falcon flew down the valley, wimbrel pairs started launching off the ground and chasing it. And it was this moment of there's something going on here. Like this is this is something that's different. This is something I, we haven't seen before. The, the The number of of these birds in one place was astounding. Um, and so I spent the rest of the day just walking down the river and looking for wimbrel pairs. And I think I found um, something like six pair that day um, and just where, where the net for the nests um, and a couple more that clearly had had uh, territories. Um, and over time, we, we spent time looking in that valley. And I think there was something close to 10 pairs um, in this one section of, of the refuge and this one, one within walking distance of our camp. Um, and that was a density that was quite high and something that we thought wasn't really interesting to, to, to explore. Um, and so we put a single tracker on uh, a single bird that year because we were using, we were actually there to study other, the golden plovers and um, uh, pectoral sandpipers and other species. Um, but we tracked one bird and we knew from the previous work that I showed you that there's this, there's this pattern of birds from Alaska going down the West Coast, and this pattern of birds from the Mackenzie River Delta going to um, you know Suriname and Brazil. But we were almost precisely positioned between those two um, areas of breeding areas that had previously been studied. And we said, well, what happens if we put a tag on this bird? And so we you know we we caught a bird, we put the tag on, um, and we, we tracked it. And look at this. This was the direct the pathway for the first um, the first wimbrel that we tagged, and it flew it flew east. So this was a bird from Alaska, and all the other ones had gone down the Pacific coast. But this one went to the Hudson Bay, and then it spent about a month in the Hudson Bay, southern Hudson Bay region, and then it launched. And over a period of I think four and a half days, it flew. They didn't actually stop here in the Maritimes. This is just a cluster of points, um, GPS points, while it was flying. It flew right over the top of that, out over the Mid Atlantic, and then uh, down into Brazil. Um, and that was the, that was sort of this critical, this, this moment where we, you know, saw something different happening in the Arctic refuge. Um, so this was 2019. We got really excited and said, okay, we're going to start a, um, a program here. We'll go back next year and we'll, we'll tag more birds and it's going to be very exciting. Now remember 2019. So 2020 comes along. Let's just say we didn't go back to the Arctic that year and go and go study birds. We wanted to, there were a uh, couple things you may remember that happened that year that made that difficult. Um, but in 2020, 2021, um, we were still under COVID restrictions and there were still challenges and problems, but I was able to get back to join a, um, a Fish and Wildlife Service team 
um, that was doing a small camp and we had to go through a whole series of rigorous protocols to get in there um, with with these COVID precautions. But we were able to, to at least do an initial sort of expanded year of study um, uh, in the uh, in the Catacturic Valley and um, tagged several more birds. And we were able to expand again in 22 and 23 um, with to to bring the the sample size up to the the point that we wanted to, and in 2023 we actually went to a different valley, the Jago River Valley, and um, just to see if something different was happening there. And so we were able to end up um, uh, catching and uh, monitoring uh, close to 30 uh, birds from the Arctic so far. Um, and here is uh, what we found. So this is the the really really fascinating map. Um, well, I'll explain a little bit about what you're looking at. So the white lines are southbound migration tracks and the green lines are northbound. Um, and one of the things we discover as you um, as you do this kind of work is that things don't always work quite the way you think they're going to. Um, as you'll see, we have a lot more white tracks than green tracks. And that's because these transmitters that were supposed to last a long time, uh, many of them did not in fact last as long as we wanted them to because when these birds get to um, their wintering locations, they essentially stop flying um, for much of the time and are often under mangroves and in, in sort of dense shaded areas. And the solar panels on these tags we use don't really work very well um, in those locations. And some of them never kind of come back to life and travel in northbound migration um, back again. So the birds are traveling back, but the tags aren't working. Um, we're using a different kind this year that's had much higher success, but we don't have the northbound data from the, for them yet because we just put them on this summer. But we're optimistic that this we'll get a lot more northbound data um, this coming year. But what we see here though, is you can see two very distinct patterns of movement um, out of uh, Alaska uh, in southbound migration. And it, what, it sh what it's showing us is that from the same river valley, um, about half the birds are going east and about half the birds are going west. Um, and, and these are not just, you know, some birds from down the river are going one way, others, these are members of the same pairs. So if the female might go, to um, uh, Panama or down to down to Peru or to Ecuador on the West Coast, and the male might go to uh, Hudson Bay and then to New Brunswick and then to Suriname or to Brazil, um, and then coming back up through um, Texas or Louisiana and then heading back to the to the breeding grounds. And meanwhile, the the mate from that bird is moving along back up through Central America, um, through Mexico on the West Coast, uh, along California, and then back up crossing Alaska and heading back to um, to the breeding ground and going back to the same valley, to the same territory and pairing up with the same bird that nested on the other side of the hemisphere um, within the same, within days of each other arriving back on territory. Um, and and this is something that we we hadn't seen before anywhere else. Um, and, you know, the first time it happened, we said, well, this maybe it was just a fluke and then it just kept happening. And it's not just the males go one way and the females go the other way. It can be either either or. Um, and sometimes both members of a pair go one way, sometimes they go the other. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a fascinating result to see that what's happening is, what it means is that any, any, any bird nesting in the refuge can potentially be influenced by all of these, these factors, this, you know, the changing conditions in blueberry farms in, um, in Nova Scotia or New Brunswick, the, you know, uh, hunting of shorebirds in, in Suriname, um, an oil spill, um, in Tierra del Fuego, um, you know, when there was a, there was an oil spill on Huntington Beach in California, all of those things potentially can affect wimbrel nesting in the Arctic refuge. And I think that's something that makes it really fascinating and unique. And that was one of the reasons the Fish and Wildlife Service was interested in working with us on this project is to understand what these connections are and sort of where their nesting birds are going and what partnerships really would be most effective at ensuring that their populations um, continue and thrive. Um, and then there's other things we can learn besides these big picture movements. So look at this, what's happening. This is two wimbrels that came out of Alaska and went down the West Coast. This is the first sort of stage of their migration heading into California and Mexico. And they, the green or the colored lines you're seeing are wind patterns. And so these birds are launching out of, um, out of Western Alaska for this multi-day flight down the Pacific. And they're do doing it while these storm systems are coming through and specifically using the storm systems and these wind patterns um, to to propel them down the coast. So some of these birds are moving, you know, at a, a wimbrel typically flies at 45 kilometers per hour in neutral air. Um, and even in, and so air, their, their air speed might be 45 kilometers an hour, but their ground speed in these wind currents can be up over hundred kilometers an hour 
um, because they get up these into these high elevation winds or at low elevation over the ocean um, with, a, with a strong following wind. And also they're very sensitive to storms that are not helpful to them. As you can see from this bird, as it gets down into crosses uh, into Mexico, um, this one in yellow, there's a hurricane coming up and it makes a hard left and diverts into, into Sinaloa uh, and avoided the hurricane. So they're very, very good at navigating these weather systems and they use those for migration. Um, and I just want to quickly go through um, the story of a pair of Wimbrel um, that we tagged in, in the Catechetic Valley and some of the distinctions between those two. So these are the two pathways um, that the, this is a pair. Um, they took very different pathways. Both of them went down the Eastern Atlantic Flyway, but took different, completely different routes and actually ended up fairly close to each other on um, the North Coast of South America. But sort of very different things are going on. And first we'll talk about this one in red. Um, and this is Sadler Rochet. You may have be familiar with this bird. We've put out a bunch of um, uh, publications or, or you know, press releases kind of on, on, on things that he's done. Um, but he's an interesting bird. Um, this was an odd movement that occurred. Um, this bird, I'm gonna go back here for a second. You can see this sort of kite shaped pattern in his, in his migration. And what he did was he started to migrate um, this is in early September out of his usual spot in uh, stopover spot in Virginia and ran into a hurricane coming up um, uh, past Bermuda. And we lost contact from September 7th to September 9th. So this straight line that you're seeing between September 7th and September 9th is not really real. We think what happened was this bird got caught in the hurricane and the, the cloud pattern was so dense that we couldn't see what was happening. We couldn't get signals from the bird. And in fact, we thought based on what was going on, there was a good chance that that bird was lost to the hurricane. Um, but two days later, the signal popped up over um, sort of the off, you know, direct e well east of Florida, and he actually flew back to the northwest and landed in South Carolina, spent a day or two there, and then flew all the way back up to um, to Virginia. I mean, it's just here September 12th, but he actually continued on back to Virginia to the exact same creek that he had been in for a month and spent another month refueling from that effort and then continued on um, to uh, to South America um, as happy as could be, but was able to navigate this rather, um, this, I think it was a category three hurricane at the time. And this was the mate of, of Sadler Rochet. Um, and she flew a different route. Um, and you can see they followed this great circle route from Alaska down to, uh, in this case, Venezuela. Um, but she made an interesting diversion uh, along the way, made a, made a left and went out of her way. And the reason she did that was to go to the, to a site in New Brunswick. And this is what we can, again, see a close up from the um, from the you know, fine scale GPS tracking, we can actually look at the individual bl blueberry fields that she was going to, the the, wind, the night roost sites, which we can identify um, for as you know important conservation sites because it's not just her going there; it's all these other shorebirds that are using these night roosts. Um, but we can look at whether she was in a hay field or in a blueberry field or on a co eating cra crabs on the coast. All this really inter interesting information um, from and the length of stay from these GPS tags. And then she continued on and made a little curve back onto her normal line um, and stopped actually crossed Cape Cod right past Minima headquarters and then landed out on um, Nantucket where she spent another couple of weeks um, foraging instead of on berries and blueberries and insects in the fields. Now she was doing, going back to being coastal and eating um, mostly fiddler, fiddler crabs and roosting um, out in a remote point in, in Nantucket. And then when she left from there, she did a nonstop flight from there, I think two and a half days um, to Venezuela. So um, really kind of different pathways, uh, but really interesting and fascinating information we can learn from, from these tags. And then just going back to the Arctic for a moment before I finish up, um, I wanna show you some of the information that we can, we can working with Fish and Wildlife Service on to show um, what they're interested in and what we're also fascinated by, um, which is really the fine scale use of habitat in the refuge itself um, during breeding and then post breeding. Um, and the, all these blue dots are, are individual locations um, of tag wimbrel. And I'm going to zoom in in a moment, but you can see they're really focused on and around these um, river systems that are flowing north into the Arctic Ocean. Um, and I'm just going to zoom in here for, for a moment. Um, these two clusters, um, this cluster in the center of your screen is along the Jago River, and that's where we worked this past summer um, tagging birds. So as you would expect, there's a lot of um, locations there. But just a little bit to the left, to the west of it, and, and to the south, there are a whole cluster of points along a different river. And we never actually went there to that river. We didn't tag any birds on that river. Those are all birds that moved to that river post-breeding 
um, and using using that habitat from other sites where we've tagged it. And you can see these other clusters around the screen are the same way. These are birds that moved out of their nesting um, habitat post post breeding and are using these other sites. Um, and these are data we would not get, be able to get. It's very difficult to get to those locations, very challenging. But um, when with these tags that we're using, we can start to map, um, again, habitat use at a larger scale in the refuge and the, in understanding the importance of these um, these tundra river systems to uh, to Wimbro. And then, um, so these key findings um, from the work so far, the Wimbro are nesting at relatively high density in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, specifically along riparian habitat, and they're using adjacent upland habitat uh, for foraging, um, which is critical for breeding success. Um, we now know because of this tagging work that Wimbro are migrating from all over the hemisphere to nest in the refuge. And as I said earlier, these factors that are affecting survival um, in the Atlantic, Central, and Pacific flyways are all relevant to birds nesting in the refuge. And so as a result, this local population in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge can tell us a lot about what's happening with um, Wimbrels in North America. And so what are we doing next? Uh, we're gonna continue this study. Um, and we have um, some, some funding for work for next year and hopefully for this, a couple of years after that. Um, to map, we're gonna be using these um, this tagging work to map breeding sites and habitat use um, where you, to understand site fidelity, like how frequent, how, what's the probability that a, bird, a tag bird will come back to um, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge and to the specific location, um, and then how that varies um, at breeding migration and wintering sites from year to year. Uh, and then importantly, one of the things that we're really focused on doing is to estimate nesting success, not just in this one location, but across the Arctic, um, using nest monitoring devices in combination with the tracking data. So we have a lot of birds that we, for example, that we've tagged in, in Texas that are giving us high quality data from other sites throughout Canada and other parts of Alaska. Um, but we need this on the ground um, nest monitoring information to be able to verify and ground truth what um, we think we're seeing with the remote data. Um, and we can use these data as well to estimate survival of breeding adults. And finally, to build a po Wimbrel population model, which will help guide and focus our recovery efforts for Wimbrel in the same way um, that we've been able to do that with the American oyster catcher and, and show success with that species. And there, I think I'll leave it for the moment and we'll jump to Q&A. Great, do you see the Q&A questions in the- I'm gonna pull it up right now. Uh, great questions, this is, this is awesome. This is gonna be fun. Um, okay, so I see a few questions here. Um, why is it so difficult to catch a juvenile wimbrel? Um, so the art of catching a bird is all about knowing where a bird is going to be. If you know exactly where a bird is going to be at a, in the future, you can probably catch that bird. Um, and so if a bird has a nest and you have the right kind of uh, equipment and trap to catch the bird, and then to, you can you can fit it out with the bands and the and the tag, um, that is the hard part of that is is really understanding where the, finding the nest. Um, they're very good at hiding them. But a juvenile wimbrel doesn't have a nest. Um, we can't we can't put tags on them when they're tiny in the Arctic because they're too tiny. Um, and by the time we can, they they can fly and can get away from us. It's also very challenging to be there at these locations in the Arctic at the right time of year in the right location. So what we're doing is we're catching them in southbound migration um, out on Cape Cod. And, and Alan and Brad could talk about this in, in much more detail. They spent a lot more time doing this. But just to let you know, um, the we, we see them in the marshes. We know they're out there. We can find them at their roost sites. But it's hard to get your hands on one um, because you need very, very... Um, the trapping is, is a challenge. They're very widely dispersed. There's about 50 Wimbrel that use the Outer Cape in fall migration. And it seems like maybe a lot, they're spread out over a large area and actually putting finding a, a finding where they're going to be, getting an effective trap into that location and then getting the bird into the trap and then into your hands is a really significant challenge um, and requires a lot, of, a lot of planning, a lot of work and a lot of scouting to make that happen, um, as well as a lot of experience on the part of the, the people doing the work. So um, it's hard, but it's something we've been able to do and um, hopefully we'll be able to be more successful as, as we expand the, pro the program. Um, and then has global warming affected the abundance of berries and invertebrates in the Arctic National Wildlife? Uh, probably is the only answer I can give you to that. We, it's a, it's a rem very remote area. It doesn't, we don't have a, a great baseline data on a lot of these, uh, these, these things to answer those questions. There are other teams that are looking at, at things like that. Um, but one of the things we'd like to do in the future is to collaborate more closely with um, biologists doing work 
uh, or ecologists doing work on exactly those kind of questions, um, looking at um, um, hydrodynamics, like the water movement and water change in water abundance, as well as change in vegetation um, in the Arctic and how that's influencing um, the, the physiological conditions of the of the space and how that might affect birds. Um, but we likely it is, but we don't we don't have the answer to that just yet. Uh, Dan Sarles says, uh, does an individual bird always take one migration path or another each migration period, or might a bird go Hudson Bay route one year and the Pacific Flyway the next? That is sort of the fundamental question that we're trying to answer. One of the fundamental questions that we're trying to answer with these tags. And um, big picture, I think it would be exceptionally surprising if we ever found a bird that went Atlantic Flyway one year and Pacific Flyway the other year, because if nothing else, the... Um, the habitat is, um, oh, the, the birds rely on knowing where to go um, and they, they have to be familiar with these stopover sites and know where to stop. So it's really challenging. And it's one of the reasons young birds may not survive you know, early on. One of the, they don't know where they're going and they don't know where the good spots are. So once they figure them out, they tend to go back to them. And so if you were to go down the Atlantic flyway one year and down the Pacific the next, you would have to figure that out for two entirely different flyways with two entirely different systems. Um, so we haven't seen that yet. So for the birds that we do have more than one year, they do seem to be very faithful to um, their their locations. And, and the previous um, work that's been done by all these other partners over the years um, shows the same thing. Uh, one of the really interesting uh, study um, by uh, Dan Ruthraff and a, a bunch of um, uh, par partners in from Alaska shows they're very faithful to um, to their long term stopover sites where they're stopping for, for multiple weeks. In migration, but they're not very faithful to the ones where they might stop for a day or two. So they they have these 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 points that they need to get to, but this, they are also somewhat reliant on a variety of of stops. So if the weather turns really bad, or or something else happens, or they get injured, they need these other stopover sites to um, to be able to refuel. But they're not, maybe move around more between depending on conditions. Um, but but the extent to which they move between year is still something we're looking at for both flyways. Um, is the Tierra del Fuego population protected? Um, there are groups in the Tierra del Fuego, Fuego region, partners that we um, we work with um, in, in South America and the Southern Cone, um, as well as, as Manomet employees, um, working on, on shorebird conservation questions throughout, throughout so the Southern Hemisphere um, and specifically in Tierra del Fuego. Uh, but no, there are a lot of a lot of threats. There's a there's a, a Western Hemisphere Shorebird Reserve Network site there. Um, but it doesn't mean that it's protected um, in the way that we that it, it maybe could be. Um, there are a lot of threats to that region, specifically from um, from oil, but now, in fact, from wind power. Um, there, the Patagonia region is um, being prospected, I would say, right now for um, for very very extensive wind farms um, to generate uh, hydrogen to sell to the mostly to the European market, um, and it's something that's of great concern to birds that are potentially going to get, impact those uh, wind farms at, you know, at the scale that we're talking about. Obviously, re renewable um, clean power is something we are, we're all striving for. Um, we need to make sure it's being done in a responsible way. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a challenge for sure in that region. Um, Arlo, I'm just going to yep. interrupt for one second. Okay. We're at 1243, but there are a lot of questions. So okay. we offer to stay on. Um, I would definitely do that. Yep, I can okay. stay on this line till till probably till one at least. Um, the other thing I can do is go through this this list, and we can um, write up answers to them. If people need to drop off, that would be fine. Um, but we can certainly uh, write up a response to each of these, and then send it out to the list of um, of participants today to make sure that you get your. Great. So whoever can stay, please feel free to keep on until one. Um, Shallow is here to answer your questions. And if you have to pop off, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and we'll see you next time. But for those who can stay, please do. Thanks, Jean. Yeah. Um, yeah. I see there's still quite a few. So we're I'll go ahead and keep going until I see the participants start to start to diminish. And then we'll go ahead and send out um, more responses. Uh, but again, love these questions. This is great. Um, this is I'm glad to be having this conversation. I wish we could be doing it in person. Um, but then you never get rid of me. Um, uh, let's see, does uh, weather dependent, but how in general, how long does Southern migration take? Um, so at, it can take, yeah, it varies quite a bit, um, but the the adults will leave the breeding grounds, um, maybe say the middle of July, um, and they're going to be getting to the 
to their wintering sites sometime um, around the end of August um, to early September, um, typically. Although on the West Coast, it can take longer. Um, it depends on uh, a number of factors, but a lot of it is more on the individual bird. Um, as you saw from the one bird that got turned back by the hurricane, that bird took an extra month to get to its uh, wintering ground because it impact, got impacted by that hurricane and essentially had to reset its entire physiology to to put on the layer of fat necessary to cross the Atlantic because of that that, that situation. But it did. It was a very experienced bird and was able to, to manage it. But yeah, usually by um, maybe early to mid-September, these birds are uh, on their... Um, on their wintering sites. And then the juveniles come through later, but it's similar to a similar kind of time frame. And most of that time is spent at stopover sites fueling up. The actual migration legs take somewhere between two and six days typically when they're flying. And then they stop for maybe somewhere between three to five weeks and then do another one because it takes so much energy to do each of those of those flights. And then the question is, are there other nesting sites other than Alaska? And very much there are. Um, so we've been focusing on Alaska because that was where we were working for um, for other projects. And then this sort of serendipi serendipitously um, work, arrived, this, this project fell kind of fell into our laps and then we were able to take advantage of that opportunity um, as it turned out to be a really interesting and important site. Um, but they, the Wimbrel will nest um, all through the McKinsey River Delta in, in Northwest Canada and then to the east of that. Um, all along the um, sort of the Arctic coast of Canada. Uh, and then there's a separate breeding population on the west side of the Hudson Bay, um, sort of more in central Canada. Um, so yes, there are, there are other sites. And then in Alaska, it's not just the refuge. Um, they nest across the coastal plain um, of the Arctic. And then in the interior, there's a different um, this is subpopulation, I guess, but a different um, area that they breed in that's not, it's not really Arctic, it's more muskeg. And then actually they'll be in areas with, with some trees. Um, it's a little bit of a different habitat. Um, uh, do we know the life expectancy of windbrills? That's one of the things that we're looking at with this tagging work is to see how long um, they live. Um, but I think with uh, we it's we would expect with a bird of this size and co with comparable species um, around the world to be probably in their into their twenties would be um, probably relatively normal. Um, the average life expectancy would be much shorter than that because of the number that will die as they're when they're young, they're still trying to figure things out. But if they can make it to adulthood, um, then we would expect them to be living somewhere between twenty and thirty years. I think would be would be normal. But it's one of the things we're trying to verify with this work. Uh, any in, any chance of ultimately understanding which migration paths juveniles take, thinking especially of offspring of mixed paths pairs? This is a great question. This is immediately what came to mind um, when uh, we saw that, let's say, you know, one member of a pair went east and one went west. You know, this is great. But there's the there's this idea that there's a genetic component to um, to migration because the parents are not bringing their chicks with them on these migration paths, right? They're, their chicks are growing up, they start to become self-sufficient, they're eating on their own and the parents just leave. Um, in fact, the females typically leave within one to two weeks of the chicks hatching, the males will take care of the young longer. But even then, once the chicks are just about ready to fly, the males migrate and leave. And now it's just juveniles hanging out in the Arctic together and they've got to figure out how to get from there, from you know east, eastern Al Northeast Alaska to Chile or to Suriname or to Brazil on their own. Um, and so there must be some, and this is true for other shorebirds as well. It's not just Wimbrels doing this. Um, they must know, there must be some sort of programming and genetic programming to, to go a certain way. Um, fly for three days in this direction until you find fiddler crabs and then stop, you know, like something like that. But, um, but what happens when one parent goes east and one goes west? And we don't know the answer to that. The only clues we have are from this year when we had a couple of birds that didn't go directly east and directly west. We had one that went west almost to almost to Siberia and then turned around and flew all the way back east across Alaska and then ultimately went to Hudson Bay and then south. And we had another one that sort of split the difference and went down in the interior until it got to um, the very southern coast of Alaska on the Pacific side and then continued to follow that. These were adults though. So um, they didn't follow the, the traditional or typical paths we've seen others do. They're taking different routes. And so it may be that the when you have a parent, two parents going a different, each in different direction, that you might have some confusion as a, as an offspring. Um, that's something I would love to address by um, actually tagging pairs offspring from these mixed path pairs 
and um, and understanding that. But right now we don't have a way to do that. It's a it's a pretty significant undertaking. Uh, but yeah, it's something we've been thinking about. Uh, are there any sites they use regularly in the Great Lakes, or are they pretty much just skipping over them? Um, Wimbrel do stop in the Great Lakes. If you look on eBird, you can actually see that it's a pretty regularly used area, both in spring and fall migration. Um, so the birds that we are tagging from Alaska mostly skip over them. There was one that stopped on a lake. It wasn't one of the Great Lakes, but in that area. Um, likely, they're, those these birds that are migrating across the interior would be stopping in the Great Lakes um, from Alaska only if there's a storm system or some other um, problem that occurs where they just fall out and they use those lakes as a recovery site. But there are Wimbrel that are using the, the one of those first loops I showed you that was going down from sort of western Hudson Bay through the southeast U.S. and then back up again. And we think those birds are typically are using Great Lakes more often uh, in migration. Um, can we talk about juvenile survival in shorebirds and the impact of increased storms and hurricanes due to climate change? Yeah, um, so the Juvenile survival, we know that hurricanes impact shorebirds in migration going over the Atlantic, presumably over parts of the Pacific as well. Um, when there are storm events, and this is not just Wimbledon, this is all shorebirds and not just juveniles, but when there's storm events in um, that these birds are running into during migration, which is, you know, coincides with hurricane season, um, there are big fallouts of shorebirds on Caribbean islands. Um, and presumably there are a lot that don't survive and just fall into the ocean that we never know about. Um, but when they are in the vicinity of a um, an island or some other point of land, they will take advantage of that, even if in good weather they would just fly over the top of it and keep going to their, to their wintering site. Um, and so it's great that those islands exist. Unfortunately, on some of those islands, um, the, this is a known phenomenon and these birds are actively hunted. Um, and they know that when a weather system come, like that comes through, there's going to be a lot more shorebirds that fall out. And then um, there's there's a, a lot of hunting pressure on, on these birds during that time. Um, so uh, it, is a, it is a significant problem, both from the actual increase in frequency and intensity of storms themselves, which is regardless of human acti other human activity, that is a real and significant problem. And then it's compounded by this hunting that occurs during storm events. Um, so... There are, there are people, there's a, there's a whole, you know, sub working group on this right now, but it's definitely an area that needs more, more um, support and conservation is, is dealing with the challenges of hunting. And then in a big picture, um, you know, as a species, we need to deal with climate change and those impacts, but yes, they would, they would have impacts on juvenile and adult survival for shorebirds. Um, these are all, these are great questions. Um, what other bird species benefit from protecting windbrow breeding areas, wintering areas, and migration stopover locations? Um, well, there, Wimbrel share these, um, these sites with a lot of other species. Um, so for instance, in Texas, um, where we're doing a lot of, uh, work on northbound migration stopover sites, um, the, some of these rice fields that the Wimbrels are using, um, are, we've counted, I think, 22 shore, species of shorebirds in a single field. Um, and the dominant species are Wimbrel and, uh, greater yellow legs, um, lesser yellow legs, but the, um, the number of different shorebird species is quite whatever. I mean, you name it, and and they would be overlapping with Wimbrel. Um, so it does make this species a um, particularly valuable um, species for for conservation uh, because of the carryover effect. Uh, is the bending and well fleet done annually, and how long does that bend, bending window last, and when is it? Um, so mostly annually there's uh, it's it's specifically focused on on primarily on when the um the juveniles are moving through which is the very very end of august but really more into early september uh, until the end of september so there's a two or three week window um in the middle of september that's kind of the best for it um and it just depends on where the birds are um and when they're when they're coming through that particular year as well as the funding and, and resources we're looking at probably expanding both the um, the scope and the amount and the, sort of the time that we're out there, because it's not just banding. We're also um, looking at, at roost site monitoring, um, trying to count how many birds are using the site, as well as understand what habitats they're using and how that changes um, as the birds are moving through. We're hoping to look at um, the, um, the islands, Nantucket and, and Martha's Vineyard as well, because the birds are also using that region. Um, yeah, we can certainly share the link on um, publications. Um, this project, we're still um, in the process of developing um, publications because we're still collecting data, um, but we will be, we certainly have um, uh, 
story, um, you know, blogs and stories and, and updates from the project that we've shared through the Manomet website and through Manomet um, social media and newsletters and so forth. Um, but we can certainly provide links to those um, as well as other relevant publications that are that from from associated projects. Um, and then when when we do have publications from this particular project, we certainly can share those. But yeah, they're all in the Manomet website. But I'm sure, Jean, you can we can do a yes. follow up with with links that are relevant. I just put one in the chat as well. Perfect. Uh, and how important is the Texas coast for migration stopover? It, it would be almost impossible to overstate the importance of the Texas coast for migration stopover for shorebirds. Um, it, the largest concentration, and maybe South Carolina would fight with us over this designation, but, um, but let's say the South Carolina, it's as important as the South Carolina coast for, um, for wimbrel migration in the spring. Um, and and the number of species that are using the Texas coast uh, shorebird species is is just off the charts. It's it's you really can't overstate the importance. If the Texas coast did not exist in its current form, for shorebirds would be um, it would be devastating. We the Texas it's extremely important. Um, and with wimbrels um, in particular, there's thousands of wimbrels that are um, using that particular uh, stopover. Um, are juveniles learning the roots and stopovers and how do storms influence that? Um, we have to assume, Brian, that, that they are, right? That they're learning them on their own um, because uh, there's no one to teach them. There's no one, there's, a, there's no one flying with the birds um, to, there's no adults flying with them to show them. Um, and then the other thing that happens is that juveniles don't necessarily come back to the same locations, um, we don't think, because uh, we know there's a lot of adults that are using the south, the central and southern um, Atlantic coast, and there's not very many juveniles using those. So at some point, the juveniles are coming through the northeast route, and some of them shift over time to using um, central and southern parts of um, the Atlantic coast. So they have to be able to shift their routes and stopovers over time and learn, presumably, from other wimbrels over the years to do that. Um, how storms influence that? I assume they're only finding some of these sites by chance. And if a storm drops them in somewhere and it happens to be good, they're going to go back to that site. And if a storm drops them somewhere and it's terrible, then they either don't survive or they or they get somewhere um, that's better. That would be, I think, I, I, that's a really interesting topic. I think we could talk for a long time about it. Um, David Marsh has asked, has the Wimberley used the Georgia coast regularly as a stopover? And how active has your participation with Abby Sterling been there? Um, Abby is one of my favorite people in the world. Um, she does amazing work on the, the, the Georgia coast. And in fact, we just had um, a couple of our tag Wimbrel from Alaska drop in on the Georgia coast um, this past season. Um, and she and Allie were able to um, work with our Georgia partners to get out and actually try to do some reciting um, for those um, for those birds. Um, so it's, yeah, very, I would say very, very close participation. Abby is part of our, I work with Abby all the time on, on uh, Manomet projects. And um, the Georgia coast is very regularly used as a stopover site. It's one of the most important areas um, in the Southeast for, for Wimbrels. Um, so yeah, we're working very closely on that. Um, is anybody working on the hunting pressure for shorebirds in the Americas? From the 1980s, there was quite a bit in Suriname on small, small shorebirds, I assume also in Venezuela especially during the political problems when people were starving in mid-teens of 2000s. I think larger shorebirds are more at risk. Are people working on this possibly South American partners? Um, the answer is, is yes, there are people working on this and that there's trying to build partnerships and understand the scope of the problem and, um, and try to make the change that's needed. Um, it is a very challenging area to work um, and it is, uh, it is something that needs a lot more attention. Um, it is one of the priorities that we are talking about as this building this Wimbrel working group um, and identifying what the the issues are and how to and how to deal with them. This is certainly an area of of concern. Um, it is true that shorebirds from little leaf sandpipers or you know semi palmated sandpipers right up through Wimbrel um, are at risk, and um, the the cultural and um, uh, just the, the 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 pressure that's on on these birds is in some cases unknown. In other cases, we know it's a challenge. In other cases, we've actually been able to address it um, mostly in parts of the Caribbean and some of these shooting swamps. Um, so there has been some progress and there certainly are some teams working on it, but it's an area that needs more work. And then finally, a reminder to tell us what shorebird species that was that you showed us a picture of. I'm gonna take a quick look over in the chat um, and see, um, there's more questions over here too. Um, see if anybody got it. I, it's, it's sort of a, 
it wasn't really a fair question because it was, if the key characteristics are not some of that bird are not something you would see. Um, nobody listed it. Um, I didn't, I, I don't know that I would have gotten it if I didn't know it, already know what it was. Um, that was a nest of a Baird's sandpiper um, that was, uh, we found right next to our, um, our camping area. And it was um, one that I had never found before. I actually thought it was a semi-palmated sandpiper when I found it. And then I went back to take a picture and get a GPS point. And it's like, wait a minute, as it got off the nest, finally, um, I was like, that, that bird's legs and wings look too long. Um, and got a, I saw that it was a Baird's. Um, those are, uh, I was just down in Chile and the Baird's sandpiper are everywhere, but um, everywhere else they're unusual to find including in the Arctic refuge. So that was a pretty exciting find. Um, just one of the things we were learning. Shiloh, that was an incredible yep. lightning round of Q&A that you did. That was no, There's more too, but we'll try to get to that um, <laughs> offline. That was, that was really incredible. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to just give a little plug for Manomet proper. If you want to learn more, go to manomet.org or join the conversation on our Facebook or Instagram channels. And for final words, um, also, if you haven't make a year on donation, please feel free to do so online. And final words, I'm going to put it up to you, Stephen. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jean. And thanks, Shiloh, for a wonderful presentation. As, as we wrap up, Shiloh, and I just want to make sure to thank our, our major supporters, which include primarily the Knobloch Family Foundation, which has been supporting the work in Texas and is now helping support Shiloh's work in the Arctic, as well as the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, which provided major support for a lot of the Atlantic coast work, as well as some of the work in Texas. But also, we want to thank all of you. Your donations to our work are really key and they're matched by those foundation con uh, conservation foundation contributions. So they go even farther and we couldn't do this work without you. So thank you so much for your support over the years. And thanks Shiloh for that wonderful presentation. Thanks Stephen, all great points. Thanks Jean. Thanks, thanks folks. And we have um, our next webinar scheduled for the small sit, which is um, in January. So, and the fisheries team is gonna do an interesting presentation. So I look forward to the information from that. Thank you so much, everyone, and um, happy and healthy holidays. Take care, folks. Thanks for staying extra. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.